out to Kate. <laughs> rapid fire and get through as many as possible rather than people running around with microphones. The only thing I'm going to ask is, or I'm going to tell you is, if you have a very technical question, for example, how many RPMs when we're going downhill at 24 knots and there's 35 knots of wind on the beam, if we're going to, we can save those, uh, those questions for the very end um, when we run out of time, and that's how it's going to work. <laughs> so, we're going to kick this off. Now, how does someone become interested in becoming a I was going to say cruise director, <laughs> different talk, a cruise ship captain. Now, if you look at this picture in the top right hand corner, that is my Premier Cruise Lines Junior Cruiser Certificate from my very first cruise when I was 12 years old. My parents took us on Premier Cruise Lines Big Red Boat, the Atlantic. Oh my God, that one person's heard of. Nobody else has heard of Premier Cruise Lines? Yes? You may have remembered these, uh, these commercials that came out. Now, Disney Cruise Line wasn't existing back in the, in the 90s, so the original Disney Cruise Line was with Premier Cruise Lines. And this is the brochure that I actually found underneath my parents' bed because it was the first big holiday that they had ever planned for my family. It was a four-day cruise to the Bahamas over Thanksgiving, and I remember bringing out this, this brochure and kind of ruining the surprise at dinner. But um, they had the Midnight Buffet. Do you remember the Midnight Buffet? Yes, do you know why we don't do the Midnight Buffet any longer? Food waste, huge amount of food waste. But um, yeah, they had the whole castle made out of lard. It was a beautiful thing back then. <laughs> but if I go back to that picture with the, um, with the certificate. So I had such an incredible time on that cruise. And I remember when I got off the ship, I had a pivotal conversation with my parents, my dad in particular. We were packing the car to drive home, and I said to my dad, I know what I want to be when I grow up. He said, what's that? I said, you know the person that plans all the fun events on board the ship? Dad said, the cruise director? I said, yes, I want to be the cruise director. And he said, well, you can do anything you want in the world, including drive the thing. And that's where the seed was planted. Now, funny story about this certificate. This is the certificate that I received as a 12-year-old, and it hangs on my bulkhead in my captain's office today. And when I was promoted to captain in 2015, I showed my cruise director this, um, this certificate and he said, you know what's really fun? I remember that captain because my dad was a cruise director for Premier Cruise Lines. And I was like, no kidding. And he said, he looked at the date and he said, you know what? My dad was a cruise director during that time with that captain. And I thought, what a full circle moment that his dad may have been the cruise director that inspired me, that had that made such a, an impression on me when I was 12 years old. And now that certificate's hanging on my bulkhead today. So very full circle moment. But uh, here is the actual moment where we were packing the car to drive home. We were the coolest kids on the ship, rocking our San Francisco 49ers jackets in Florida in November. Um, but the picture on the left, that is my older brother. The reason that I put this picture up is because it's the most awkward photo I have of my older brother and sibling rivalry is a real thing. <laughs> he has grown into that face. I do have to brag on my brother. He is, um, he was a butcher and now he owns an Italian restaurant, which is kind of funny because we have a Scottish background and he's married to a girl from China. So, <laughs> but if you're ever passing through Hillsboro, Beaverton area in Portland, Oregon, outside of Portland, Oregon, he has an Italian restaurant called Nona Emilia's. Pop in, say you've been on cruise with me, and you'll get some free breadsticks. <laughs> I think that's the deal. That is the deal. Um, but moving on, now I tell you the reason that I wanted to go to sea is because I wanted to be the cruise director and dad said I could drive the thing, but the real reason I wanted to go to sea is because the crew members on board that ship made such an impression on me. One in particular, this lovely gentleman between me and my mom, that is Pascal, our waiter. So I wanted to go to sea to find him. Now, funny thing, I was telling this story and then on the last day when everyone was disembarking, I was standing on the gangway saying goodbye to our guest when a gentleman came up to me and he said, I know where Pascal is. I said, no way do you know where Pascal is. He says, no, he's one of my best friends. Pulls out a picture, 
He has Pascal on his phone. Uh, he is best friends with him. Now the good news or maybe the bad news, depending on how you look at it, Pascal is happily married. <laughs> good news for my husband, um, bad news for me, but this is just one of those things that you know our crew members do make such a lasting impression. As a 12 year old, and I remember who our waiter is by name, um, it's really, really neat, and that's the number one reason that we hear that our guests come back to us time and time again is because of the impression that our amazing crew members make on you. So, uh, now, where do you go to study? Where do you do? Where do you go to school? I went to California Maritime Academy. There are a couple of different ways that you can work your way up through the ranks at sea. Number one is what we call through the hawse pipe. That's where you go to sea on your own. You accrue so many sea days. You study on your own, and you sit for your exams and you'll work your way up that way. I went through the Maritime Academy, which is more of a fast track way because all of our courses are laid out. It's very, very structured. Um, so I went to California Maritime Academy, which belongs to the California State University system since 1996. The full name is California Maritime Academy Vallejo slash California State University. Um, and I studied marine, um, marine transportation was my minor. Business administration was my major, but I was also taking courses uh, in seamanship, in celestial navigation, all of the navigation courses on the side. Every summer, we would go on a training cruise because we had a training ship, the Golden Bear, that was stationed at the ship. And this is where the, the cadets would get their hands-on practical experience of going to sea, and they figured out pretty quickly if going to sea was something that was in their future and in their cards, because a lot of people figured out pretty quickly that going to sea was not for them. For me though, I got the wanderlust bug, I loved it. And so after four years at the academy, I graduated. As you can see in the picture on the left hand side, I was one of eight women in my graduating class of 150. I'm one of two women that still sail. My roommate in college, she is the captain on the training ship Golden Bear, the first woman to captain the training ship at Cal Maritime. She was a captain with Maris Climbs for quite a few years. Um, there's my brother on the last day of school. See, isn't he a handsome devil? He is, he's all right. Um, now, this picture, so when I, when I was in uh, sophomore in California Maritime Academy, I applied to be, every, every sophomore year we would go on a training cruise and it was a commercial cruise. So we got to choose the company or more like the company got to choose us based on our GPAs. Cruise ships were the number one pick for everyone. Everyone wanted to be on a cruise ship, obviously for the lifestyle that you have on board, the places you go, the people you meet. Um, I got to go on banana boats. Kind of tells you where my GPA was. I wasn't the smartest kid in, the, in school. Uh, so I sailed on banana boats, taking bananas from Guayaquil, Ecuador to Long Beach, California. Does anybody know anything about banana boats? There's only two things you need to know. Spiders and snakes. Spiders that were the size of little puppies, snakes that were as wide as a puppy. Um, I had the first day that I joined the ship, the captain told me to make sure that my sink in my cabin was plugged because he didn't want anything coming up through the pipes. That's when I really figured out I wanted to be on cruise ships. <laughs> so when I graduated from Cal Maritime in 2000, I sent my resume to every single cruise line in the industry. And this was right when the internet was taking off, so I sent it via snail mail and via email. After about 18 months, I hadn't heard anything back, so I changed my resume and I applied to be a bartender with Disney Cruise Line. Now, Disney Cruise Line, they took that resume and they said she is not qualified to be a bartender because I had never served a drink a day in my life, but she is qualified to drive our ships. Mm. Makes sense, right? Anyway, they sent my resume off to the, the right department, that was the Marine Department, and I got my foot in the door as a third officer on Disney Cruise Line. Now, unfortunately, at the time, they only had two ships, the Tragic and the Blunder. Um, <laughs> oh, you've heard of them. No, I'm just kidding. Fantastic company, beautiful ships, but they only had the two ships in their rotations, so there wasn't a lot of room for growth or promotion at the time because they didn't have any plans to build more ships. But at that time, Royal Caribbean, celebrity sister brand, was building the Voyager class and the Radiance class of ships. And so I applied on a Tuesday to come over to Royal Caribbean. On Wednesday, they sent me a nice email back saying, unfortunately, at this time, we don't have any openings. That same Saturday, they sent me an email. They said, can you be on a ship tomorrow in St. Martin? <laughs> 
So I joined Royal Caribbean as a second officer. I spent 13 years there as second officer, first officer deck, first officer navigation, first officer safety, chief officer safety, and staff captain. And in 2015, I was sailing with my husband, who was the chief engineer on Quantum of the Seas. We were off the coast of Oman when he came into the bedroom very early in the morning and he said, Celebrity Cruises is on the phone. And I said, why is Celebrity Cruises calling me? And he said, I think they're calling to offer you the position as captain. Well, that's going to wake you up very quickly. I jump out of bed. I take that phone call. And it was our president and CEO, Lisa Lutoff Perlo, who I had met at Royal Caribbean when she was in charge of the Marine Department. And she had come over to Celebrity Cruises. And one of the first things that she did when she took over as president and CEO was offer me the position as captain with Celebrity. And I said, no, I'm good. <laughs> Just kidding, I said, hell yeah, I'll be right there. And she said, well, just hold on, because it's going to be a couple of months before we announce this. And I said, well, can I just mention it? Can I tell two people in particular, my mom and my dad, about this promotion? She said, I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to send you a letter of why you are being promoted. And she wrote me this beautiful email that I printed out. And when I got home to Las Vegas, I went over to my mom and dad's. On Father's Day, I had this letter in my hand. I gave it to my dad while I went into the, the fridge and I was pulling out a really nice bottle of champagne and opening it. And my dad started reading the letter and he started reading it out loud. And when he got to the part about being promoted to captain, he looked up at me, looked back down at the letter, back at me, tears running down his face. My poor mom is shoving ice cream in her face. She has no idea what's happening. <laughs> Uh, but it was a very, very special moment, and to be able to do that on Father's Day was a big deal because my dad had actually wanted to go to sea, uh, but he, he went to, into the Peace Corps where he met my mom in Ethiopia, and when he came back, he, the, he said, I want to go to California Maritime Academy, and they said, unfortunately, you are too old to enroll in the academy. So it was always at the back of my dad's brain and always kind of his dream to go to sea, but uh, they do get to come and sail with me from time to time. That is my mom and dad in the bottom right hand corner. That was when they came to sail on Celebrity Edge. Um, now people will say, can your family sail with you? Yes. Do we like them to? No. <laughs> Not so much. Unless they are um, so self-sufficient, you know, because you've got some crazy hours when you're working on board. We are on 24-7. For, I do three months on the ship and then three months on vacation. But for the three months that I'm on, 24-7, I need to be available. And um, so if you have family that are coming in sailing that aren't very self-sufficient, it can be a lot of work and it can be very tiring. Now, luckily, my parents are self-sufficient, but they are also known as the albatross. And I've met some people this cruise that can attest to that fact because every time my parents cruise, something happens. It's not usually a good thing. It's not one hurricane in a cruise, it's two. Um, we've had pets that passed away. My best friend's parents were sailing with my parents when my best friend's father found out he had pancreatic cancer on board. He's okay. Um, my mom got her intestines twisted in a wicked session of Zumba and I had to land her in Barbados for three weeks for an operation. So, as much as I love my parents, I have told them one further incident ends their cruising career. You will be happy to know they are not on this cruise. <laughs> Although at some times it may have felt like that. But, um, so those are, are my parents. Now, th that's a little bit about how I joined Celebrity Cruises. This name tag on the personal side is worn by this lovely gentleman, this big, bald, beautiful man. That is my husband, Nicola. He is the fleet chief engineer for Royal Caribbean Group, which means that he travels between all of the ships in Royal Caribbean Group, Royal, Celebrity, and Silver Sea, doing different technical projects on board. We actually passed him on this cruise when we passed the Independence of the Seas because he's over there for a project on, I think it was the second night of the voyage. It was the evening chic uh, night, and we were sitting up in the ocean view, and I said to the staff captain, which Royal Caribbean ship is that? And he said, that's the Independence of the Seas. Well, I jump up and I start waving, not like you can see me. <laughs> and I sent him a message and I said, babe, you're passing us right now. He's like, yeah, but I'm in bed, so, <laughs> okay. I say the secret to a happy marriage is never being in the same place at the same time in 12 time zones. Now, when we first started going to sea, technology was very different. We were sending telex messages at $7 per word. We would get to a port and there would be a bank of pay phones on the pier and everybody got 20 minutes to make their call before the next person was banging on the glass saying, your time is up. 
Now with technology, we have Starlink on board our ships. I actually call my parents and my husband several times throughout the day, and I can see them on the other side of the phone. So it's made the world a much smaller place and going to see much easier. Um, so that's a little bit about my husband. I will tell you our first date. We met on Royal Caribbean. I was a first officer. He was a staff chief engineer, the second to the chief engineer. And he asked me when I got off of watch at midnight to throw on a boiler suit, a coverall, and meet him by the kids club on deck 12. Now as dodgy as that sounds, I was all too keen. Midnight rolls around, I throw on my coverall, I go running up to the kids club. He had me climb up the ship staff where he blindfolded me and had me slide down the stained glass windows of the chapel onto the Viking crown, if you're familiar with Royal Caribbean ships, where he had a blanket, strawberries, champagne, under the Caribbean stars, with dancing with the stars going on on the pool deck down below. Now the thing is, as beautiful as that is, when you set the bar quite literally that high, there is nowhere to go but straight down. No, this year we will celebrate 18 happy years together, and I say happy years because we've seen each other two years out of that time. He has managed to surprise me throughout the years. A couple years back, I was the captain on Celebrity Equinox, and we were doing some overnights in New Orleans for Jazz Fest. I thought he was on the other side of the planet in Romania. The guest relations director called me. It was her birthday. She said, can you come down to my cabin? I have a surprise. I thought it was a surprise for her birthday. I open up the cabin door and there's my husband. You can imagine my surprise finding my husband in the guest relations director's cabin. <laughs> surprise! Uh, but he was able to spend those three days with me and flown from Romania just to, just to spend those three days. So we do keep things exciting. We don't actually look at our schedules either because it is a happy coincidence to wake up in the morning or to dock of your ship in the morning and look out and find that the other ship in port with you just happens to be the, the one that your husband's on. That's happened to us in Puerto Plata, in the Dominican Republic, in Napoli, in Italy. So it keeps things very exciting, not keeping track of where each other is, if that makes sense. But the true love of my life, that is not the world's ugliest chihuahua. That is a cat. And the reason that I have Bug on board is because when I was promoted in 2015, I figured out pretty quickly that it can be lonely on board uh, because the captain is like the CEO. You're, you're kind of the boss of everyone. And so at the end of the day, it can be pretty quiet. Now some of the other captains have their entire family sail their entire crews, their wives, their kids. Uh, for me, it got kind of lonely, and so I asked the office, can I have a pet? And they said no. I said, well, over in Royal Caribbean, I worked with Captain Johnny, who had a parrot. I worked with Captain Sparrow, who had two cats, and I know of another captain that has a dog. They said, okay, what would you like? I said, a monkey. <laughs> They said, no, nope, no monkey, what else? And I was scrolling through Instagram and I saw hairless cats, stinks cats, and I thought, that is the most unusual thing I've ever seen. I became a little bit obsessed. And so Bug joined me on Celebrity Summit, my very first ship as captain, at three months old. She'll be eight, uh, eight years old next month. And uh, she's been on every ship that I've sailed on. Now she is not an emotional support animal. And you can imagine that having you know, a captain who's responsible for 5,303 lives, um, doesn't need the emotional support animal. That's probably a good thing. But what she is known as is the maneuvering support mammal. And this video will explain. Bug is fondly known as our MSM, maneuvering support mammal. She has access to the bridge through the captain's cabin because my office is directly attached to the bridge. So she'll come up for arrivals and departures. She likes to stand directly next to the person that is doing the maneuver, whether it's the docking or undocking of the ship. I've had officers who have said that just by standing next to them, she takes away their anxiety during the maneuver. She never judges or interferes, but it is nice to have her up there. And while she likes the warmth of the electronics, she knows not to be on the side with all the buttons. <laughs> It's funny because we do have covers on all the important button, buttons and people assume that's for the cat. That is for people because people are the ones that make the mistakes, not the cat. So uh, our MSM, that is her official role and that's the story and I'm sticking to it. 
Now, I got to be part of the delivery of this beautiful ship. It is the highest honor for a captain to take a ship from the time that it's being built in the shipyard and bring it out and bring it to life with the delivery. Uh, when I joined Celebrity Beyond, it was in January. The ship came out in April. And I'm going to show you a little bit of the kind of the behind the scenes of what it looked like while we were putting the ship together during the new build. This video was made by Celebrity Cruises. There we are in the shipyard in France. Um, where all of the edge class vessels have been built. Now Celebrity Beyond and Celebrity Ascent, our newest ship, are different than her sisters, Celebrity Edge and Celebrity Apex, because we are 20.5 meters longer. And even though we're the same class, it does mean that the ships handle a bit differently. We have the same power as Celebrity Edge and Celebrity Apex. 19,000 horsepower in our bow thrusters and the engines are the same, as well as the configuration. But because we're stretched longer, we handle differently, which means we can take different wind on the side. Um, actually, we can take less wind on the side before we're ordering tugboats than our sisters because of that stretch. Um, but there's Eden, a lot of areas getting the last touches. One of the very cool things about being part of a delivery of the ship is we would have our executives from Shoreside. At the time, it was our chairman, Richard Fade, and our president and CEO, Lisa Lutoff Perlo. They would come on board the ship and we would do walkthroughs of different areas. And they would say, you know what? I don't think this color works here. I don't think this art works here. We should change this and mix this up. And to have that kind of behind the scenes knowledge of why things look the way things look or why we did certain things on board. For example, the deck that I'm standing on right now here on the stage, this stage was originally black, but we had a leak right up there during the new build process, which damaged the decking. And when we were looking at replacing it, they suggested that we put a gray deck on here so that we could do projections. And if you're watching the shows, particularly from deck number five, it's a completely different show because of what you can see going on on the stage. And it's different from every venue that, or uh, vantage point that you sit in the theater. But that was one of those cool things behind the scenes that we learned during the new build process. Would you like to see where we live? Yes, and when I say we, I don't mean me and all of the crew. Uh, this is the captain's quarters, and we'll take you through here. There's the welcoming committee. Now, the closets on the left-hand side, I get to leave my uh, personal effects on board, so I have three closets for myself, and my reliever, Captain Leo, has three closets for him. There's the bathroom, the tub is for Bug. True story, the bedroom. It's nice because it's inside so I can close the door so if I have to sleep when it's daylight, I always take a nap in the afternoon because if they're gonna need me, it's gonna be in the middle of the night. So taking naps is important. My living room, I do have an infinite veranda so I can put the windows down. I don't because of bug. There's the galley. I don't eat in my room because I think that's kind of lonely if I just sit there and eat by myself. So I tend to have most of my meals up in the ocean view. My office, which is attached directly to the bridge, and I do leave this door open all the time for two reasons. One, I can hear the alarms. The alarms on the bridge are the first indication that they're gonna need me or they're gonna call me. The second thing is, so Bug has somebody around 24 seven because the bridge is always manned. Now out here on the bridge wing, this gives us a vantage point to look all the way down the side of the ship when we're docking or undocking. The reason that we have this window in the deck is because before technology, when we liked our position on the pier, we would make a mark. It was the ship's name on the pier, and that way when we were maneuvering the next time in that port, all we had to do was line our body up on top of the mark, and we knew we were in the exact same position as the previous time. I'm gonna show you the most important piece of equipment on the entire ship. We don't go anywhere without that. That is the coffee machine. The cockpit is designed much like the cockpit of an airplane. Uh, we run bridge resource management, which is also developed around the aviation industry. This is our safety command center, so we have the evacuation pod and the incident control. Everything is touch screen. We can see the fire, uh, where the fire teams are distributed during emergencies. We can have con contact with the evacuation control center. We don't carry any paper charts on board our ship. All of our charts have been scanned and digitized. Now it's all touch screen. Look at that, oh, fantastic. We do still have chart drawers, which I'm not sure why. Um, there are two chairs in the center cockpit. The one on the port side, the left-hand side is the captain's chair. The one on the right-hand side is the officer of the watch's chair. If I'm not on the bridge, they are more than welcome to sit in my chair. It's not those old days where nobody sat in the captain's chair. The ship's wheel, smaller than the wheel in your car. It's made out of wood because we are superstitious. And if you need luck, what do you do? 
Touch wood, knock on wood. You can see we could actually play soccer up there. There's a lot of space um, going out over onto the port side bridge wing. The bridge wings have the same electronics, the same controls that we have in the center cockpit, but it just means that we don't have to go running back and forth when we're docking the ship, and we can do it from the convenience of having that vantage point of looking all the way down the side. Now people say, we can see you on the bridge. As you can see, we can see you too. <laughs> All of you, <laughs> even when you don't think we can. So that's a little bit about the bridge. All right, and here in the top left-hand corner, that is the bridge of the training ship Golden Bear at California Maritime Academy. Now, when I was going to school, we had grease pencils on radars. We had Loran C. Um, I believe last year, Loran C was, uh, they, they got rid of the last station for Loran C. So everything's been updated, everything's been, advanced, now we have GPS. There's still only one chair on the bridge of the Trading Ship Golden Bear, and that is for the captain. But in the bottom right-hand side, we have the bridge of Celebrity Beyond. We have our radars that can overlay onto our charts and vice versa. We have 563 buttons. And how do I know that? Because during the pandemic, I was on board for 318 days straight. We had a lot of time to count buttons. Now, during the lockdown period, uh, Celebrity Beyond, or Celebrity Beyond was uh, just an idea. She was being built at that time, but I was on board Celebrity Edge. And for the ships that were in lockdown, we did different things. For example, Celebrity Edge, we were anchored off of the Bahamas, about 12 to 14 miles off of uh, Perfect Day at Coco Cay, which is Royal Caribbean's private island. Now, at the time, when we did a voluntary pause in service, we said goodbye to our guests on March 15th. It was the end of a really great cruise that we had. It was our International Women's Day cruise where the entire ship was well-manned. So my entire bridge was women. The entire leadership team from the hotel was also women. But we said goodbye to our guests on March 15th, expecting to see everyone come back in two weeks. That turned into 15 months later. And during that time, we were most of the time sitting at anchor. Celebrity Edge was designated as the mother ship. And what that means is while the other ships were anchored around us, we would make calls into Port Everglades or into Miami to pick up supplies and take them back out to the anchorage where we would distribute the, that supplies using our tender boats. Uh, it was a really unique time. And when we shut down, I stood on stage and I said, you know, we're saying goodbye to our guests, expecting to see them in two weeks. And we got to do some really cool things. One of those things was to put all of our crew members into balcony staterooms. We were the first ship to do so, and the reason that we did it had nothing to do with the pandemic, had nothing to do with COVID. It was the idea that we could put our crew members in our guest staterooms, they could experience the ship from a different perspective, so that way when the guests came back on board, they could speak authentically to the amazing product that we offer. Well, because of the pandemic and because of COVID, it worked out that everyone had their own room and they had access to air because obviously we were going into uh, lockdown and we were doing, um, we were being assigned to the staterooms where we couldn't leave for 15 days at a time. Um, but all of our crew, crew members got to experience that. We put them in the penthouse suite. We put them in the iconic suite. We put them in the edge villas. And um, we also got to do things like throw weddings on board. We had two crew members in particular that were supposed to go back to Mauritius and get married, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, they weren't able to get home. So we threw them a wedding in Eden. The bride's brother was also working on board Celebrity Edge, and the morning of the wedding, we put our tender, our launch, in the water. We sent it over to Celebrity Reflection, which was anchored two miles off. We went and we picked up the bride's father, who was the executive chef on board Celebrity Reflection. We brought him on board Celebrity Edge. We had the bride blindfolded, and uh, as she walked down the back ramp of Celebrity, of the uh, Eden rather, her father was there to meet her halfway. She removed her, her blindfold, and her dad walked her down the aisle and gave her away. A lot of really unique events happening during the pandemic. One of the other things that happened is I saw very early on people were sending me messages on social media saying, isn't it sad when you look out and you see all of these empty ships around you? Because it started out with 10 ships around us, and by the time that we were going back into service, there were about 35 different cruise ships at anchor. And we started out with a crew of 1,350, and we went down for the majority of the time to 112 crew members on board an entire ship, just 20.5 meters shorter than Celebrity Beyond. You could imagine, you could go your entire day, you could go your entire week without seeing another crew member. 
And that's why we started something called our Hope Floats Porn Salute. I sent an email to all of the ships around us and I said, would you join us every evening at 7.30 and blowing your ship's horn? And that's gonna let our crew members on board know that we're safe, we're healthy, we're happy, and we're hoping the same for everyone back home. Every single ship around us joined us in that Hope Floats Horn Salute. And that continued until June of 2021 when Celebrity Edge was the first ship to sail from the United States with a return to service. So we got to do some really, really unique things during that time. And I'm gonna show you a video later on, one of the most unusual things that I've ever seen at sea that happened to happen during the uh, pandemic. All right, here's my bridge team, this uh, lovely bunch. The way that the bridge is made up of, you have the captain, I'm four and a half stripes, the staff captain, four stripes, second in command, fully licensed, qualified captain that can take over for me if something happens. The third in command is our safety officer, they're three and a half stripes. They are in charge of the training of the crew, everything safety related, our inspections of our safety equipment on board. They are also a licensed captain. So if something happened to me or the staff captain, they also have their captain's license. Then we have two chief officers, a chief officer deck and a chief officer navigation. We have a first officer safety. We have two second officers, two third officers, and an apprentice officer up on the bridge. The way the bridges are manned, we have four, uh, three watches that do four hours on and eight hours off. So they do from 12 to four, four to eight, and eight to 12. Because people see me around the ship and they say, why aren't you on the bridge? I did that for 19 years so I could walk around and talk with you. Uh, so they do the four hours on, eight hours off, and we do rotate them through so they get experience of all the different positions. The same thing with maneuvering the ship. Everyone assumes that the pilot maneuvers our ship, they do not. Um, actually, they never do. And uh, that's because we need to train our crew members so that when they reach the position as captain, they have hundreds of arrivals and departures under their belt. I just signed the staff captain's maneuvering log this morning. He has 365 docking and undockings. And uh, by the time he becomes a captain, he will have probably a couple hundred more under his belt. So very, very experienced. And the reason we do that is because we were finding a couple years back, I should say maybe a couple decades back, the second in command, once the captain retired and the second in command was stepping up into the captain's role, they had never maneuvered a ship in their life. Not the cruise I want to be on. I don't want to be that first cruise. So now they've got a lot of experience by the time they reach the position as captain. The parabolic ultra bow. When you look at Celebrity Edge class vessels, one of the most distinguishing features that you will notice is our bow. As it may look unusual, it is becoming the norm in the cruise industry for a couple of different reasons and this video should explain why. The Celebrity Edge has a parabolic ultra bow, or some refer to it as an X bow or an inverted bow. It's a refined concept of a bulbous bow, which has been commonly used on cruise ships for efficiency since the 1980s. We still have a baby bulb, but by wrapping the open space between the bulbous bow and the hull with steel, the ship is not as dependent on the factor of draft or how deep the vessel sits in the water, which was previously a huge consideration with traditional bulbous bows. Our bow is literally cutting edge as we move through the water smoother, more comfortably, more fuel efficient, and in my opinion, pretty badass looking. True story, true story. So because we don't have that big wide open space like a traditional bulbous bow where the water can slap and shudder the ship, uh, we slide right on through. So what's old is new again. This is not a new feature on ships. Uh, it goes back many, many years, but it is relatively new on cruise ships. But you'll continue to see this because it's safer, uh, more comfortable, and more fuel efficient. Now, just aft of our parabolic ultra bow, on the bottom right-hand side, you're going to see our bow thrusters. These are propellers which are in tunnels in the forward section of the ship, which we use to move the bow from side to side. 19,000 horsepower I mentioned earlier, and on the stern, we don't need stern thrusters because we have azipods, azimuthing pods. The cool thing about azipods is they're not traditional propellers with a shaft that runs through the engine room. These are completely independent units which hang down from the ship's stern that will turn 360 degrees, negating that need for stern thrusters. And the idea of azipods is wherever the propeller blade is pointed is where the ship's stern will go. For example, we're making headway right now, which is that direction, so the azipods are pointing forward and they're pulling us through the water rather than pushing us through the water. If we wanted our stern to go to starboard or to the right-hand side, I just turn the azipods so the blades point to the right 
and the stern will walk to the right. Very, very maneuverable, um, fantastic to have on board, and they are on every single ship in our classes of vessels. We've got the Millennium class, the Solstice class, and the Edge class. We all have azimuthing pods. You can see their general size with the gentleman that's standing just below them, um, but they are very maneuverable. Would you like to see the engine room? All right, so we can't take people down into the engine spaces since 9-11, but we can show you what it looks like from this video. And we're gonna start in the engine control room. The engine control room in the engineering department is made up very much like the deck department where you've got the captain, the chief engineer is the captain of the engine spaces. This is St. Nicholas, patron saint of seafarers. He's also Santa Claus. Because we were started by the Chandra's family, a Greek shipping family, we have a nod to our Greek forefounders by having St. Nicholas on the bridge and engine control room. We are, did we pass halfway yet? No, there's halfway. So everything in the engine spaces you can think of from um, obviously the machinery, we've got our tanks which hold our fuel. We have marine gas oil and we have heavy fuel oil. We have our water tanks, we have our ballast tanks. This is one of our main engines. We have five main engines on board. We call them too big, too small, and an extra small. Now the fuel that they use, I mentioned the marine gas oil, it's like jet fuel. And the heavy fuel oil we um, take on board, we have to heat it up to 120 degrees Celsius. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, 120 degrees Fahrenheit in order to bring it on board. We have enough fuel on board to run for a month solid, 300 metric tons. And we bunker every week, we kind of top up about 400 metric tons of heavy fuel oil. If you're wondering what that is in gallons, 105,000 gallons, and I don't get any mile points for that. <laughs> I've been trying to for years, but I have not been able to. We also have a scrubber system on board. So when we're burning the marine gas oil, it's very clean, very good, I shouldn't say very good for the environment, it's still a fuel, uh, but it's very clean. So we don't need the scrubber system. But when we run our heavy fuel oil through our engine, it produces an exhaust and so therefore as that exhaust is going up through the ship stack our scrubber system they look like little sprinkler heads and they're ejecting an alkali water mixture and what that's doing is that's separating the sulfur content from the exhaust that sulfur content is dropping down into holding tanks where we can discharge that shore side so when you're looking at our ship stack and you're like oh there's a lot of white what we call, that's not smoke, it's a plume. And that just means our scrubber system is working and it's removing the sulfur content from our exhaust. We also have been equipped with shore power. We were the first ship in celebrity uh, cruises to be equipped with shore power, which means when we go to a port which is equipped with shore power, we can basically plug into the port and shut our main engines down and run solely off of the power in the port. So our very first place that we commissioned this was our very first port of call, which was Southampton, England. And we're gonna show you what it looks like. <clears throat> a lot of safety protocols in place because obviously we are working with quite a lot of electricity. We were the first ship with celebrity to be commissioned and the third ship to ever receive power in the port of Southampton. 11,000 volts is what we're working with. They basically can just drive it up to the ship, plug us in, and we're good to go. Sorry, I don't know why that does that so loud. Uh, but as the availability of shore power becomes uh, more readily available in ports around the world, this is the way we are going to go forward with our machinery. Uh, now, if you can see it, you can be it. Social media is a big part of my life because when I was growing up, the only thing I saw about cruise ships was what I saw on the big, or um, what was the show? The Love Boat, thank you. I was going to say The Big Red Boat. The Love Boat. And as much as I love Captain Steubing, that is not an actual depiction of what goes on day to day uh, on board Celebrity Beyond in particular. I've started something called the Captain's Log. When I joined in January, January 19th, for this particular contract, I said every day I'm going to make a log of the things that go on behind the scenes so it can give a glimpse into um, the life of a captain and living on board a cruise ship. Things that we deal with that maybe you weren't privy to before. Um, but I put that out onto, the, onto social media and it's also to garner an interest in a career that I didn't know was available until I was 12 years old and my dad said you could do anything including drive the thing. And it has garnered a lot of interest in um, young women and young men to go to sea. It was also important during the pandemic because this is how we stayed connected to our guests and our crew. Because if you remember what you saw about cruise ships, 
during the pandemic was not very glamorous, was not a very positive light, was not the reality that we were living on board the ships. And so we used social media to put out what we were actually going through from day to day. Um, so if you want to kind of see an inside glimpse into a world of living on a cruise ship, uh, you can find that Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Okay, now the most unusual thing that I have seen during my 28 years of sailing, this happened in June 2020 during the lockdown. We had gone up on deck to listen to our Hope Floats horn salute when I had a drone in my hand. I was going to put it up to, gather, to, get, to get a nice view of the sunset, but the sun had already gone down. And we saw this object appear, and when it appeared, it was just over the retreat, as you're familiar with the Celebrity Beyond. Celebrity Edge had the same thing. We had the retreat in the forward section. Saw this giant black jellyfish. If you ask me how big it was, I'd say it was at least 12 feet long and probably about six feet wide. It started at the bow of the ship, and the interesting thing is the way that the trajectory of it, it floated directly through the center line of the vessel, over the pool, directly through the X in our ship stack, and past the stern. And this is the little video that we've got of it. Nearest land, 12 nautical miles away, that was Coco Cay. And I apologize for the shaky video, but we weren't expecting to capture that. channel and a couple of different other networks with experts uh, trying to dissect and figure out what it what it was and giving their opinions on it to this date we have no idea what it was but one of the things I like to mention is I call Las Vegas home because my dad my parents lived there uh, and we ended up in Las Vegas because my dad worked at area 51 so during the pandemic when I couldn't get home I like to think that was dad sending somebody to come and check and make sure we were okay but to this date we have no idea what that was uh, if anybody has any guesses I love to hear it and with that uh, that ends my presentation portion hopefully I've answered some of the questions that you've written down but uh, Shauna are you around I'm always around. She's always around. <laughs> Perfect. How many questions did we get, Shauna? About two million. Sweet. And it's lucky I used to be a kindergarten teacher because some of your handwriting, <laughs> I had to decipher. It means we've got a lot of doctors in the room, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, we have some good questions today. I'm excited. Excellent. First one, and I'm excited about this one because I love this television show, is from Below Deck, Captain Sandy. Oh, yeah. Are you friends with Captain Sandy? And that comes from Ottawa, Canada. Yes, I, I had the privilege of meeting Captain Sandy for Celebrity Beyond's naming. She came on board, and uh, she is a wonderful woman. In fact, she is the godmother to our sister ship. Her and her sister are the, god, the godmothers of Celebrity Ascent, which is very cool because Celebrity Ascent is the first ship to have two brothers co-captain, that's Captain Dimitri and Captain Tassos, uh, very good friends of mine. But yes, Captain Sandy, I've got her on speed dial. She is an incredible woman. Um, what you see on TV is not always reality, and I can tell you in person, she is a fantastic person. And when we were in Athens this past summer with Celebrity Beyond, she called up and she said, would you like to visit my yacht? Well, yeah. Yeah, I would. So you may see in the upcoming season there might be a little cameo. Just say it. Just say it. Woo! <laughs> I'm obsessed with that show. All right, next question. Uh, do you communicate with other ships you see along the way? Are we talking to them? Yes. Uh, most of the time now, again, with technology, uh, the ships that we've got in our fleet are all equipped with Starlink. So if we're going to call somebody up, 
rather than everyone else listening to us on the radio, because that's what we do, as soon as another ship's calling, you kind of all tune in and listen to their conversation. Now we mostly send messages on WhatsApp, uh, but from time to time we will call them up on the radio, just you know, see who's on board, if we know the captain or if we know the crew, and you know, just say hi. But the radios are used for safety and navigation, so uh, nothing on channel 16 that is monitored by everyone. So uh, yeah, we'll switch to an off channel if there's something that we need to say, but. Yeah, most of the time, if, if we know somebody on board, we'll say hi. Say hi. Okay, this one's about our crew. So the crew are amazing, uh, which I agree. And what is your favorite crew story? Like about the crew, like that you've seen, like a really inspiring, positive story. Gosh, you know, I think, I think the progress and, and watching them. For example, I had um, a crew member named Liza who was a cleaner, one of the cleaners that you see um, making sure that our restrooms are always tip-top shape. And she, um, her, during the naming ceremony of the ship, she caught me afterwards and she had painted this um, watercolor painting of me and a bug. The talent that she had in that, it blew my mind. And I said, I think there's another career that, uh, that you would be really good at. And do you know what she ended up doing? She went back to maritime school and she is getting her license to sail as an officer on the bridge of our ships. Uh, you know, starting out as a cleaner on board, we have cruise director Luigi. Yeah. Luigi started out also as a, a cleaner. Utility a, cleaner. Utility cleaner. And now he's the cruise director on Celebrity Ascent. And you know, a lot of the times it's crew members want to come on board and, and maybe it's not the job that they start out which start out in, which is going to be the job that they're they're amazing at. There are other things, you know, the other talents that they have. And this is where your feedback really comes into play because when you write their names on the comment cards and that comes back, maybe, you know, someone wasn't on the radar for a certain position, but because of your feedback, that puts them into a different perspective and that will get them in the right place. So your feedback is really, really important. If you remember the people's names and just take a picture of their name tag. It's not weird. It's cool, you know, and uh, <laughs> you know, if you've got your camera and it's like, yeah. oh, it's because you will forget there. how to the names. Yes. We all forget them. Yet. Yes. Yeah, but that is very important. Okay. Which barriers have you faced as one of the only women captains of major cruise lines? So I wasn't, no, I wasn't the first in the cruise line uh, industry. I was number five. The first two were th with Royal Caribbean, Captain Karen and Captain Liz. They've since retired. Now there are only three female captains in the industry, but we have three staff captains in celebrity alone that are in the pipeline. Um, I would say I love this question because everyone expects that I have horror stories about coming up through the ranks. But the thing is, when I was promoted in 2015, I was standing on the stage of Celebrity Summit and I was addressing a crew of 950 from 62 different nationalities. And that's when I realized I am in a very unique environment. I'm surrounded by so many different minorities, be it race, religion, cultural background, sexual orientation, gender, whatever. We are all a minority of some sort on board a cruise ship. And because we are so different, we celebrate those differences. We don't pick on those differences. And so it was never me being a female in whatever position I was along the way, it was just me being Kate. And I think being in that environment is key. And so surrounding yourself with that diversity is one of the secrets to my success and the reason that I'm here today. I really like this next question. It's Phyllis from New York City. Now that there are two brothers commanding a ship, not a boat, what are the chances that a captain and her husband, chief engineer, and their cat will command as the first family at sea? Oh, zero. Zero. And I can tell you why, because that would mean I'd be the boss at home and at work. So, poor bugger needs a chance, and I don't need bug. Yeah, yeah. No, that would be very awkward. Although it would have been really cool because the chief engineer's cabin is located on the port side on deck 11 on the other side of the bridge. So we could basically just like leave our doors open and have this massive, yeah, take that iconic suite. But um, no, not, not gonna happen. Yeah, it's funny on ships because it's, you know, on land, if you're dating someone or you're married, you know, there's time in between where they go to work or they do it. Here, every day you wake up and there they are. There they are. There they are. Okay, who makes the decisions 
regarding medical emergencies? Is it the captain or the medical staff? Very good question. So when we have a medical emergency on board now, our medical department is manned by two doctors, three nurses, and a medical secretary. Obviously, 24-7, the medical facility is available. When we have a medical emergency, when the patient is with the medical team, the doctor is the first one to give me a heads up. Uh, and will say we have a potential medical evacuation based on these symptoms. Then the doctor is contacting Shoreside. We have a medical department, Shoreside. They're also having a conference uh, between our Shoreside doctors and our shipboard doctors, and they will determine if the medical evacuation needs to occur. At that time, or during that time, the bridge team, we're looking for a couple of different things. We're looking for the nearest MRCC, which is the ones that will dispatch either a helicopter or depending on the port, maybe they'll send a boat out, or if we're close enough to a port, we will speed up to get there and offload the patient alongside the pier, which is what we did yesterday in Jamaica. Um, now, if it's a helicopter evacuation, those are very, treacherous uh, and it's a lot of stress on the patient so the patient has to be able to withstand a helicopter lift on board celebrity beyond we don't have a helicopter pad where the helicopter could land we have to do the hover operation so they will send a helicopter out they'll send a rescue diver down which preps the team and then they'll send the lift or the basket down and then they'll take the patient off with the basket while um, they're doing the hovering. And we do that operation not from our helipad forward, but we find that it's better to do it from deck 16 on the port side, just aft of where the retreat is, because there's more space up there. So we've done helicopter evacuations from there, um, or they'll send the boat out, or we'll go alongside the pier. But it's a combination of us speaking with our shipboard doctors, our shoreside doctors, and then whichever uh, team will be sending out the, uh, the medical help. Okay, this is an interesting one. Have you ever had any experiences with stowaways? With stowaways? Yeah. Um, you know, we've got a couple of people that know that the lifeboats are where we check first. <laughs> um, but no, I've, I've never had anybody stick around for a cruise that we didn't figure out. <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. trying to hide. Not yet. Okay, now this one gets asked a lot because you guys are very interested in this. Rogue waves. Have yes. you ever encountered a rogue wave? I have never encountered a rogue wave, knock on wood. Uh, and I only know of two people that I've ever met in my 28 years at sea that has encountered a rogue wave. And this question also leads into tsunamis. What do you do if there is a tsunami? The first thing that we do is get the heck out of Dodge if we're in port. Because obviously the closer you are to land, the more you're going to feel. The tsunamis start out at sea, and the closer they get to land, the more shallow it becomes, the higher they become. So if we have a tsunami warning, the first thing we're gonna do is drop lines and get out to sea. The farther we go out to sea, the less you're gonna feel. We had a cruise in the Mediterranean last year. It was a very interesting cruise, and maybe some of you were on it. It started out where we got stuck in port in Civitavecchia because of weather. We had 50 to 60 knot winds. All of the ships were stuck in port, which caused us to miss our first port of call, uh, which was in, um, in Sicily. And then on our way to Greece, we came across um, 200 migrants at sea that we needed to, to be involved in a rescue operation. And then we were arriving to Kuzidasi uh, just before picking up the pilot, and we felt the ship shudder. And I look at my navigation officer, and she looked at me and she says, I think that was an earthquake. And I said, what do you mean an earthquake? And she had felt an earthquake at sea before, and sure enough, she goes on her phone, she's got a nap, and there was a, um, what was it? I can't remember the magnitude of it, but it was only 13 miles off of our port bow. First time I ever felt an earthquake at sea, and yes, you can feel it. It does give like a shudder. We did not have earthquakes this cruise. Um, but yeah, that's... Someone also asked about hurricanes, if you've ever been in a hurricane, or what we do during a hurricane. So we have a, a weather forecasting station shoreside. Uh, we're also obviously checking the weather. We're about seven days out. The best weather forecast you're going to get is 24 hours out. But the cool thing about being on cruise ships is we are mobile. That means we can move. So when we see that there's a hurricane in a particular area, we can change the deployment. We can change the itinerary. Of course, for those uh, communications, we're having conversations with our shoreside team. We're looking at the ports that are available to relocate the ship, and we can just move around it. I've been in the remnants of hurricanes. Um, one of those cruises that my parents was on that I mentioned, we had two hurricanes. 
We were coming out of the St. Lawrence, we were up in Canada, and the hurricanes had been passing through, and rather than going around and out into the hurricanes, we just kind of slowed down and stayed off of the coast of Canada and just reallocated our itinerary accordingly. So we have options, which is very nice, because when you're on land, not a whole lot of options when it comes to <laughs> hurricanes. If it's coming, it's coming, but for us, we can relocate the ship, which is nice. Okay, let's switch gears here. This is from Jan from Chicago. You work three months on and then three months off. What do you do when you're off for three months? I sail. Yeah. I really do. Uh, last summer, I spent eight out of my 12 weeks as a guest on board this ship. And the reason that I did that is my husband and I, we did a really nice vacation in Tuscany, Italy. We checked into a hotel and it was a five-star hotel, beautiful hotel, and I was expecting entertainment. I was expecting food. I was expecting <laughs> everything you find on a cruise line. And I swung that door open with those expectations and I found a room. And I said to my husband, why did we get off the ship? And he's like, good point. So I spent eight of the 12 weeks on vacation on board Celebrity Beyond. I love that people know your preferences. I love all of the things, and I, I find that it's the best way to vacation. Um, but I also go home from time to time, and when I go home, we do different projects. The last project we did is we redid the master bath. The, uh, beautiful. But I say we, I filmed Supervised. it. Supervised. Yeah, that was my contribution. But um, yeah, so we'll do the honeydew list, and, uh, and but for the most part, I like to spend my vacations on board the ship. Yes. Okay, you need to check out this bathroom on our Instagram. It's beautiful. Okay, do you as captain actually stay and watch on the bridge for some number of hours? No. And as I mentioned earlier, I did that for 19, 19 years. If the bridge team needs me, I'm available 27, uh, 24 seven. I can get from my bed to the center cockpit in 12 seconds flat. I actually have a video from this cruise uh, when they called me when I was on the phone with my mom and I had a face mask on, I had my, my robe on, and my mom said to me, what if they need you on the bridge? And as she said that, literally an announcement went through, and yeah, so I, I do have a video of what that looked like. I'm debating whether or not to post that, but you, you may but see it. But it always you happens, know. when we do the theater production shows, you probably know, I don't introduce the theater production shows a lot of the time, but I'm always ready in case there's a show stop. The one day is that I'm gonna wait to get dressed, the show stopped. So you're running down in sweatpants, so. We, we found with the chief engineer and the staff captain, whenever they go to the gym, something happens. So I've told them to stop working out, because, yeah, not Murphy's good thing. Law. Law. Oh, this is a good question. Uh, your video with the dolphins, when you were swimming with the dolphins, yes. and when you dive, who takes those videos? Uh, who was with me that day? Oh, we had a, a shoreside. Um, basically, when I go out uh, into, the, into the water, I will take whoever wants to go with me. Now, sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad thing. I took a third officer with me once. Uh, I said, do you want to go swimming? Do you want to go see a shipwreck in Grand Cayman? And he was like, yeah. So we get on the beach and we're uh, putting our gear on and he puts his snorkel mask so the mask ends here and not over his nose. And I said, have you ever snorkeled before? And he's like, no. I said, do you know how to swim? No. And so yeah, I have to vet them a little bit better. But that particular video, I had my GoPro in my hand. We were in Bonaire, which is my favorite island in the Caribbean. If you've ever been to Bonaire, it's like putting your face in a fish tank. It is absolutely stunning. And we were just swimming around. We were looking at a turtle. You always see something right there, by the way. And uh, we popped our head up, and a, there was a canoe, and they said, there's dolphins. And the dolphins swam right to us, so I threw the, no, actually, I had the camera for the dolphins. Yes. Yeah, yeah, just kind of going chasing. And I almost drowned because I get so excited. Regardless of what the marine life is, it could be dolphins, it could be whales, it could be flying fish. I'm so friggin' excited about it. Um, and I almost screamed and inhaled water. So yeah, there's there's a hazard, but it's, uh, it's really exciting. The bridge team knows that. If they see marine life, if they see rainbows, or if they see a possible green flash, which we did see last night. Did anybody else see the green flash? Yeah, a couple of people. Now, I, I should mention a green flash is a phenomenon that happens at sea, but you have to have a very clear horizon, no clouds on the horizon. Don't stare at the sun like while it's in the sky. Just when the top rim is about to set below the horizon, that's when you're going to look at it. And what it tends to look like is two green Pac-Men on either side that work their way towards the sun 
as it's setting below the horizon and they consume the sun and it's green and it's only for a fraction of a second. So last night was the first time our new third officer, Apostoli, had seen it and it's always neat to see someone's first reaction to a green flash. Okay, and this is a good one to end on here. What is your most memorable moment since you have become a captain? Ooh, hard. I think probably taking delivery of this ship. Um, yeah, I think I think that was pretty spectacular. Getting the keys, uh, and the keys aren't actually, we don't have actual keys to the ship, but when we were doing the delivery, our uh, CEO of Royal Caribbean Group, uh, Jason Liberty, he was walking with our president of Celebrity Cruises. They were walking from Eden to the Grand Plaza where we were gonna do this big, um, delivery thing with the crew and Lisa said to him do you have the keys and, and he said yes she said let me see and so he has just these keys in his hand she said oh no 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 you need a keychain with that and he's like where am I gonna get a keychain they were passing the shops at that time and there happened to be a Louis Vuitton keychain and she's like take this one so they grab it they give me the keys you know he didn't get that keychain back yeah I still have that lucky keychain so yeah I think that was probably one of the special it is yeah. ladies and gentlemen